five years from now, 10 years from now? Do you think that people will look at right now as the bottom in Chinese equities? I definitely think so. I mean, the market is too large to go away. Forward Guidance is brought to you by VanEck, a global leader in asset management since 1955. You'll be hearing more about VanEck ETFs later on, but for now, let's get into today's interview. Very pleased to welcome to Forward Guidance, Jason Sue, Chairman and Chief Investment Officer of Raliant. Jason, great to, great to see you. How are you doing? Hi, Jack. Glad to be on your show. It's my pleasure. So, Jason, you are a very uh, take a very quantum mental approach to your investment framework. Tell us uh, about uh, the work you do in China. You've got a, a fund that invests in China, and you have a specific approach to screening out specific China companies. And I feel like what you screen screen is uh, very interesting because you know the Chinese market is in a is in a pretty pretty brutal bear market. What is the is the phrase brutal? Is that too dramatic or is that is that justified? No, I think brutal is absolutely justified and it's it's probably spot on. But so first and foremost, you know, we're emerging market expert, you know, we 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 really have our pedigree in the institutional space, uh running money for large sovereign funds, especially those that are in, in Asia, you know, where you run money for government of Taiwan and, and and other large Asian government pension funds. And we kind of narrowed that that down to single countries because we're getting mandates from these, you know, individual uh, country pension funds. Uh, you know, China happens to be, you know, one of the biggest markets. It happens to be a market where when we were launching our funds that had a lot of global interest, you know, both positive and negative. And the methodology, the quantum mental methodology, right, the quantitative screening plus sort of sensible model building uh, applies really well in China. In fact, many of the quantitative models, something we in academic call factor models that has stopped working in the U.S. just because the U.S. market's pretty efficient. You know, most of the, you know, tricks that companies might play on the accounting side, you know, most of the techniques for teasing out good companies, they don't work as well in the U.S. because it's so competitive. It's been arbed out, but they work tremendously well in emerging markets and they work really well in China. So Jack, to your point, you use these accounting red flag tools that's been developed back in the 80s and 90s in the U.S., like they don't work in the U.S. anymore, but they work really well in terms of helping you screen out companies that are problematic, you know, whose numbers are not as reliable. They do a really good job in China to help you avoid um, those problem stocks. What would be an example of, of that be, of something where maybe the human eye can glance over it and miss it, but the algorithm that, you know, the quant data, data analyzer spots some shenanigans and screens it out? There are a few broad categories that we actually screen for. Uh, one is screening for the quality of the company. One screens for relative valuation. And one screens for sentiment. Uh, so so that's kind of look at, first of all, valuation, because I think that is easiest to understand. It works surprisingly well in all emerging markets and works super well in, in, in China. Uh, you know, screening for valuation is basically looking at, you know, is this company cheap relative to the proper peer group? Is it cheap relative to its historical valuation range? And that tries to help you capture, you know, market goes through valuation cycles, stocks go in and out of favors. And you, you're, you know, it's like Warren Buffett says, right? You're going to be more successful over time on average if you buy cheap than if you buy expensive, right? It could be a great company, but if you pay too much for it, the return is going to be there. It might be a bad company, a lot of negative news, growth is slow, but if you pay a dirt cheap price for it, you might still come out ahead, right? So valuation is huge for us. And it works particularly well in emerging markets really well in China because their valuation swings are that much more dramatic, right? So cheap can get way too cheap and overvalued can get way too overvalued. So you do want to use that signal and that's probably one of the most powerful ones. Now, the next one that sort of interacts really well with valuation is quality, right? Because you don't want to buy a company that really is a bad company, right? It's, you know, on its way to death, right? And then, or it's a company that's forever cheap, right? You think of... You know, state-owned utility companies, and there are lots of those in emerging markets, and certainly there's no lack of large sterile enterprises that are just not very productive, right? So, you know, if you buy a cheap company that is a state-owned enterprise that's rather dysfunctional, you'll never make money, right? Just be forever cheap. So you also want to screen for quality, so make sure that the growth characteristics are there as well, and it does have a healthy margin. There's a, you know, profile of earnings growth over time. And then that sort of valuation signal interacting with you know, growth, uh, growth related type quality uh, metrics helps you, you know, 
get at buying a, a, a growing cash flow at a big discount. Now, what's also important is, of course, sentiment, right? because oftentimes something that is cheap may be good quality. You can wait for two years before there is catalyst that causes it to be revalued, that causes analysts to come back and talk about that stock. Right? You don't want to wait too long because otherwise your capital is not very efficient. So it's also important to understand sentiment. And, and by looking at sentiment, uh, looking at flows, looking at sort of you know, changes in sort of uh, analyst recommendations, it also gets you a sense of, you know, are you near a catalyst? That's about to sort of ignite and propel stock price upward. For your China uh, RAYC, I believe is the, is the ticker. Is it you also try and find companies that are owned by Chinese nationals, i.e., not foreign investors? It's not just like people in you know Greenwich, Connecticut, pouring money into <laughs> Alibaba. Yeah, so you know, in, in our strategy, uh, we we look at obviously all the Chinese stocks, and what we have concluded is that really you're going to buy a lot more of the sleeper stocks that no one's have heard of, companies that are still young in their growth cycle, buying what are called onshore, basically companies that are listed in domestic Chinese stock exchanges rather than kind of the Alibabas and Tencents, which by the time they list are already with the world's largest, you know, one of the world's largest tech companies, fully valued, everyone's jumped on the bandwagon already, right? So we just believe in, look, you don't want to be buying a stock that everyone knows is, is, is great and, and, and you buy it when it's very expensive already, right? You want to go into um, the onshore local market where there's not a lot of competition from international capital, uh, where there's more opportunity for alpha because the local retail investors make more mistakes. They don't understand a good thing when they see it, just lacking global investing experience. Uh, so that's where we focus. We just think you know, if you buy the onshore shares, you're might more likely to buy something that will grow to become much bigger. Uh, you have an advantage because you're trading against not international hedge funds, but really trading against sort of local retail uh, investors. And the result of that is if you look at the performance of the onshore versus the offshore, uh, the differential in returns is, is uh, I think, cumulatively about 50, 60 percent. Really? So, so like since since inception? Uh, so, yeah, over the last three years. Uh, and that that just tells you how how different you know the offshore shares and the onshore shares can be in terms of um, performance. Got it. So, so that would be when you launched this this strategy uh, three years ago, or because you launched a fund later, right? The the, R, the 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 ETF later. I know they're different. No, the 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 ETF is is now three plus years in terms of track record. Yeah. So over the time that we have had the fund that has you know invested predominantly in the A shares, the performance between say a A shares company versus say the Alibaba. Uh, in the ten cents, uh, that that the cumulative performance difference is is night and day. It's enormous. Uh, if you've actually seen companies have uh, actually deliver positive results um, at the same time, where most of the offshore companies have had you know a minus seventy percent return. So you don't own any shares that could be owned by foreign investors. You only own the the A shares. Generally, yes. Most of our portfolios would be shares that are uh, hard to access and primarily onshore, because that's where we see opportunities are. I mean, what what is your sentiment on Chinese stocks so much? I mean, the the bear market has been, as I said earlier, so brutal. The, brutal. The, the <laughs> PE ratio. I mean, what is it? Eleven, ten. You, you you tell me. Depends obviously which which index you use. Yeah. Why have stocks going down so much? Is it you know, represented in the earnings? Have the earnings been uh, um, bad? I mean, I know there's a you know, pretty severe real estate contraction there. How do how have you interpreted the you know very sharp fall in Chinese stocks. And uh, then we'll get to your, your views going forward. Yeah, Jack, it really is dominated by by sentiment. Clearly, there's been a slowing down post-COVID, uh, obviously during COVID and all the way through to post-COVID. Uh, so the slowdown in the underlying fundamental growth is absolutely there. But if you look at corporate earnings growth, right, year over year on average, it's actually growing, just not as fast as historically. What's really delivered this, this brutal, uh, negative performance uh, the last two, three years has been sentiment, right? Uh, the the Chinese shares, it's called the onshore shares, um, have historically traded at about 14 times earnings. So they, they've historically always traded at a lower multiple than say the S&P 500. And that's reasonable, right? S&P 500 is a, you know, it's a, it's a more liquid market, safer market. So it trades at a higher valuation multiple. So the Chinese companies, despite the high, faster growth, actually trade a lower multiple to reflect the riskiness. Now, if you go from an average multiple of 14 times down to, you know, 
like a two standard deviation extreme. I think it was as bad as closer to being eight times, right? You know, even if earnings is growing, you're going to have very bad returns because prices are falling, reflecting extreme pessimism, right? If you look at Chinese shares, um, be it the offshore one trade in Hong Kong, US or onshore in China, there's a lot of fear being priced into it. Uh, I would say what's priced into it. Uh, a, a conflict with the US via Taiwan, uh, that's definitely priced into it. Um, worsening trade relationship with the US, US being one of China's biggest trade partners, right? And that's, that's scary. I believe that somehow, you know, Beijing is going to abandon capitalism and perhaps go back to the way of central planning, right? Good. Like very extreme and very irrational, but um, the fear is there. And so you have these fear all priced in. Uh, and that's, that's really largely what's driving um, a very negative sentiment. What is your view? Why did we, uh, are you broadly bullish or bearish on the, the Ch Ch Chinese market? And what do you think could be a, a catalyst for the pain to end? I would say I am a contrarian. So it's just important for people to understand why I have the kind of po portfolio positioning I have is I'm a contrarian. So whenever I see an asset class that's just had tremendous headwind in terms of bad publicity, bad optics, uh, negative press, I actually get a little excited. I go, okay, you know, things are probably not as bad as what's made out to be. Prices are probably too pessimistic. There's an opportunity there. Uh, so I like China right now because it is really, really cheap. And just the kind of headwind it has faced, real or imaginary, uh, are, are, are enormous and, and, and probably overblown. And so I like it for that reason. Uh, so when you ask catalyst, right, uh, what, what will it take for sentiment to shift? And when I say it's sentiment rather than sort of actual fundamental economic damage, um, yeah, you know, like real estate is an issue. Um, the slower growth post COVID is an issue, but it's, it's not like, you know, China is now experiencing what the U S experienced in 2007, where, you know, people are being foreclosed on, right. You know, this is a country where people buy real estate a hundred percent on cash, um, part regulatory and you know, lack of cheap financing. So, you know, people, people feel a little poor that you know, real estate prices has come down, but, you know, people are not losing their home, not getting margin call. And so, you know, a lot of this feeling poor is quite sentiment driven. So sentiment is a little easier to fix, right? You are more likely to get a catalyst that could fix sentiment. Uh, but in China, that usually historically, if you look at like cycles, it comes down to um, the state spending. Right. And it's not like simple rate cutting monetary policy. It really is the state going out there and say, okay, households, if you're not going to spend money, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to send money uh, for you. Um, and so it's going to be targeted government spending in the key uh, areas and sectors. And that will gradually then sort of kickstart. And depending on how big that package is, the speed of it getting sort of rebooted uh, can be faster or slower. So you said earlier that the people the uh people who buy houses they're buy exclusively with cash in china so in china so so i'll give you a funny anecdote right so in china your first home you could put 30 percent down and finance now financing costs in china is meaningfully higher than in the u.s historically um so you know people people actually do have to commit down a, a meaningful down payment and have the cash to, to to cover interest right so there's none of that u.s ninja loan during the uh you know the, the mm -hmm. our, our real estate crisis right now if you want to buy a second unit in most cities and provinces that is actually forbidden and so it's actually quite funny in china you have to go down to, a lot of households go down to to the city hall to get a fake divorce so they can buy a second home and so if you're actually you know at city hall filing for a divorce they actually would ask you are you here to buy another apartment that's why you want a divorce or do you actually need you know marriage counseling because you you have a you know marital problem so if you're actually getting a divorce to buy another apartment like you just go to that line and we're going to process and if you're actually getting a real divorce, you have to go get marriage counseling. Um, and, and so the government has actually been trying really hard to prevent any speculation. And so from forbidding you to buy a second unit to you buy a second unit, you just can't get financing, right? It has to be 100% cash down. And Jason, it, but is that, you can't buy a second home, is that new or has that been in place no, for a No, no, that's time? been there. That's been there for a long time. Okay, so who are the speculators who are buying all of these uh, uh, apartment buildings then? So when people say, oh, people are speculating, they are speculating, just they're speculating with cash. So you, you want to think of it as um, people in China buy real estate as a store of value, 
much like, mm -hmm. you know, say uh, my Indian friends, they buy gold as a store of value, right? Yep. They don't expect gold to, you know, breed and provide little gold nuggets as dividends, right? They don't expect <laughs> it to be productive, right? Just like Chinese people, they buy real estate, you know, they don't rent it out for additional income. It's not investment property. It's a store of value. Just it happens to be real estate rather than gold. You know, it's equally displayable as a, as a display of wealth, I guess. Uh, and so people in China who buy many, many apartments, it's not on leverage, right? They actually just have a lot of cash that they put in the bank and then they would put into real estate. Uh, actually, a tiny, tiny fraction of their wealth goes into the stock market, right? Stock market for yeah. the Chinese yeah. is still not viewed as a a channel for for wealth storage or wealth growth. Is that uh, encouraged by the Chinese government? Is that, you know, why is it in America that, uh, you know, people say, oh, I've, I've got some savings, I'll maybe put a little bit in real estate, but I definitely want to you know, participate in the stock market. Whereas in China, they mostly steer towards the, the real estate market. Is it, you know, go back to, to history? Is it encouraged by the government? Why, why is that the case? I think it's, it's very uh, cultural. So it, it, it probably has to do with, um, with, you know, the fact that, you know, the, the Chinese stock market hasn't existed for a very long time, right? Like in the U.S., you can trace the stock market all the way back to the early 90s. The craziness in the past is, 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 is all old history and and it's actually been a stable wealth creating uh, market right for most people now in China like the Shanghai Stock Exchange only reopened for business about 20 plus years ago and for the first five ten years it only listed a few big state owned enterprises so it wasn't you know it's nothing like the s p 500 where you can buy into you know great entrepreneurs and, and great product companies right mm -hmm. and so stock market is a very new thing uh, for uh, for the Chinese. Uh, and I would say because it's so retail in nature, because you know China doesn't have its big pension funds investing in the stock market just yet. Because again, pension in China is pay as you go, so you know there's not a lot of assets stored in its its retirement market. Uh, so it's a very retail oriented market, and as a result, prices fluctuate way too much. Retail doesn't always understand fundamentals, so oftentimes it could be a story stock that gets too overhyped that runs up and crashes. So from people's experience. It feels a little more like casino than it does like sensible investing. So I don't think mm -hmm. there's a great preference for real estate, but there's probably more of a distrust for the stock market. Okay, that that's interesting. And so you said you made a contrast. You know, un unlike the subprime bubble of 2005 or six in the U.S., when people who were buying property were, were buying it with with credit that they you know probably or, or may not be able to pay back, the Chinese speculator, the Chinese buyer of property, is buying it out with cash that they have. Okay, but but there is a tremendous amount of leverage in the Chinese real estate system, right? It's just on the developers' side who Correct. are now going bankrupt, and you know the dominoes are falling. Tell us about that side. Yeah, if you're gonna blow leverage, right? It's a little bit better and a little easier to handle when it's on the developer side than the household side, right? Because when it's the household, it becomes kind of a national crisis and a social issue. Uh, on the developer side, uh, essentially, a lot of developers are heavily geared. So, Jack, you're absolutely right. A lot of developers. Uh, you know, unlike the U.S., where like if you're developing a giant community, right, you, you kind of build four homes, sell those four homes, you get paid, you build another four homes. It takes a while to build a whole community. Like the Chinese developers just have multiple sites all going at the same time, assuming they can always sell it, they can always get financing. And so some of them are geared up, like not, you know, what we're talking about, 20 to 1 type of gearing, right? And so uh, a lot of developers who's now gone under, it's not because... Their property is no good. They, they, no one wants to buy by you know the, the project they're developing. It's that the government is so afraid of how this might unwind badly. The government basically said, if you're too geared up, right, you just can't renew your financing. You have to sell your project to someone. You either complete it and sell it, or sell it to another developer that isn't as geared up. And so it's been um, this almost engineered bankruptcy for the super geared up developers. And what they are, what, what's actually now happening is the bank is then facilitating a transfer of these projects to developers that are less uh, leveraged. Uh, so my, you know, from from our own data and research, you know, most of the projects uh, are high enough quality that they will be bought and taken over by developers that have the balance sheet to do it. Um, many developers will, will go under, but the project themselves will actually be completed and delivered. There's going to be delay, and people are going to be, be, be anxious about that, um, but it's not going to spill over. What do you think the effect on the Chinese economy will be of multiple very large developers? I mean, Evergrande, the biggest property developer in the world, I think, you know, going bank, bankrupt, 
uh, other Chinese property developers going bankrupt, and particularly uh, Chinese citizens who bought uh, houses and property with cash, and they've already paid the money, but the the, pro- the project isn't being devel- uh, developed. That's what you referenced, I think, when you said talked about delays. What what are the spillovers that have we, have we seen in the Chinese economy already? And what do you think is is coming on the way? Even if this is not kind of on the scale of our kind of global financial crisis, our real estate crisis of 07, um, I would say the psychological impact cannot be uh, understated because for a very long time, um, Chinese households just assume, look, if I store value in real estate, real estate always goes up. So, you know, there's this income effect and wealth effect coming through the real estate channel. It's the first time for them to first experience the other direction and to go kind of into this fear state that it may not ever go back to the old days where real estate is such a reliable creator of wealth. And I think that's creating tremendous angst for people. Not only have they seen their sort of wealth uh, um, fallen because real estate prices have fallen as a result of, you know, the, the developers going bankrupt, but there's just sort of this confidence about, well, what is the future for all real estate or for real estate prices? If, if I can't rely on real estate as a way to create wealth, uh, well, what am I going to do given, you know, bank deposit yields is now two and a half percent and then the stock market is too volatile. So I think all of a sudden you have this very sort of negative sentiment because people's people are sort of entering a new phase where they don't actually know how to generate sort of passive wealth increase. Do you think that Chinese property prices, you know, which I believe have fallen somewhat, do you think that they will continue to fall? Uh, I would say it's hard to say. Uh, I would certainly say it's less liquid now because it used to be a buying frenzy, right? It used to be for you to buy real estate, right? The government really tries to stop you. Uh, and it becomes a lottery system, right? You have to win a lottery before you're given the the, the opportunity to buy an apartment. Um, so that's all largely gone away except for the most premium trophy uh, uh, you know, luxury apartments. So, you know, certainly the, the, the kind of frenzy, the liquidity, you know, we probably won't see that returning anytime soon. Uh, now, do we go into sort of long-term downward trend? Uh, I also don't think so as well. Um, again, right, there's, there's no forced selling, and most people you know, in China have been sort of buying, or they were buying holes. So you don't have a lot of uh, sort of selling pressure. Um, and you actually continue to have sort of buying demand as young people. You know, one of the prerequisites for uh, getting married is you need to you know, buy an apartment and move into your own place. So they all, you know, as people continue to go, you know, mature into the marriage age, right? Demand is always going to be there. So, you know, I don't see a risk to the downside, but I would also agree that the kind of run up that was experienced before is unlikely to return either. Is it fair to say that Chinese property prices in the past, at least, were uh, well above historical norms for the rest of the world? Like I'm looking at, you know, oh, yeah. Shanghai price to income ratio of 45. So that means it's completely unreasonable, right? I mean, if you look at Shanghai, um, you know, Shanghai and Beijing are probably the extremes, and you can map that to, you know, the premium, you know, locations in Hong Kong, Taipei, uh, Seoul, uh, Tokyo. It's right up there, right? And then you factor in the fact that you know the, the per capita income uh, is just sort of lower in China, right? Just the, the unaffordability is is a tremendous issue uh, for China, as it's true for most of the um, the, the other uh, you know uh, Asian economies. Uh, yeah, this is this is this is actually a more of a social problem than it is a financial problem for most Asian countries. It, it, it is a social problem. Tell us about uh, the impact you th- think this will have on the banking system. Because if you know property developers, if they go bankrupt or if they have to you know attempt to renegotiate a loan, it doesn't just hurt them. Often it's the bank who you know will end up holding the, the property. And if they their collateral is a property that's overvalued, that could have a severe impact to the banking system. Of course, the the you know nightmare scenario is that the true value of the assets is less than the li- you know, liquid liabilities and it's insolvent. And there's a there's a bank run. So I guess there's you know insolvency, and then there's a liquidity crisis. Maybe let's start off just with the liquidity crisis. What are the uh you know what are the odds or, or propensities of a bank run um in China? When you mention these sort of spectacular bank runs, um they actually become the reason why we will see less bank runs, and certainly for China, because um you know the U.S. have probably demonstrated beyond doubt that if you have a a central bank that can print your own currency. And you mm-hmm. sort of leap into action, first sign of trouble, and just commit to backing 
um, banks, you know, with unlimited resources, you can stem a bank run on day one, right? I think the U.S. learned that during the global financial crisis and demonstrated that in spades uh, when Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic Bank, uh, you know, sort of first, you know, started experiencing bank runs. So I think the Chinese sort of learned that. Uh, and uh, and again, you know, they got obviously uh, their own currency that they can print. Um, they got a very, very strong balance sheet. Uh, and, uh, and so they're actually quite credible when they say they can back any, any bank, any bank that's in trouble, whether due to liquidity reasons or actual structural reasons. So I would say the U S has sort of taught China how to deal with that. And, and I don't expect a bank run. So the, the, the people's, uh, bank of China has a, I mean, ton, tons of, uh, very, very, very liquid assets. You know, no, no, no one's worried about people, people's bank of China running out of money, but I'm, I'm talking about the. The, sorry, the, the banking system, the com- commercial banks, um, you know, some of which are, are state owned, some of which are, are publicly traded, but I think, you know, the government is still very heavily involved. You, you can tell us a little bit about, about that. There's a sense that the Chinese government really controls the banking system. So they, yes. they would prevent, is that true? That is true. I mean, uh, most of the, I would say just, if you rank the banks, you know, from one to 100, you, you can probably see that, you know, uh, that, 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 you know, Top eighty are all either directly owned uh, or significantly owned, uh, and then therefore significantly controlled by uh, by the state. This is really the case where they are. You can think of them as an extension of the People's Bank of China, right? So the central bank will always come out and back these banks, um, and even if there's you know enough of private shareholders in there. I think the government has made it very clear that they will back banks to avoid any kind of systemic uh, crisis from from sort of a bank run. Got it. Okay, so that's the liquidity front. Now tell us about solvency. If you know the, a lot of the banks have been making a tremendous amount of commercial real estate loans to developers whose the collateral is you know projects that are valued at forty a pr- price to income. Uh, is there a risk that you know the, the, a lot of the Chinese banking system is is insolvent if prices go down and the the, the people who are borrowing money from them go bankrupt? So I would say the one party that's been most concerned by that. And have spent the most time trying to study, well, how do you deflate that bubble without blowing things up? Is actually Beijing. Uh, I can tell you, Beijing's biggest fixation is how to avoid the Japanese type, you know, a real estate bubble from crushing uh, the economy. And of course, later on, how to avoid the US gold financial crisis type of a real estate induced and systemic uh, bubble. Uh, and, you know, this is why. It's actually it, before long before it, it, it sort of rolled out the three red line to deleverage the real estate cons- uh, builders. They sort of done simulation to see, okay, well, all right, how much have all my banks actually lent out to these people? You know, what's in the shadow banking? You know, what's sort of direct lending? And is there a path to gradually deflate that? And so they done all these simulations and kind of figure out what is the maximum paying that they can take and how much they need to back it if things don't go so well. That was all sort of taken into account before they laid out the the three red line policy of like, okay, if you go above this line, you can't get refinancing, right? Because they kind of know, okay, if the line was too aggressive, then too many, you know, developers are going to get in trouble all at the same time and they probably can't handle it. Um, and so it was actually a very carefully, so that's why I, I said it's an engineered bankruptcy of the Evergrande. And they, they've sort of done stress testing to know that they can handle that. So it's not like a disorderly bankruptcy. Uh, are, are, are some of the banks taking a haircut? Absolutely, right? And, and, and you know, sort of punishment for, for making uh, you know, unwise loans. What you're also now seeing is a lot of the haircut is actually born uh, by Evergrande's equity shareholder and, uh, and Evergrande's sort of debt holders uh, before the bank um, sort of actually takes their hair, haircut, right? Because the, the way in which this is structured is, the banks actually hold it held on to collateral. And so, you know, the equity value gets destroyed first and the bank can sort of you know, take whatever, you know, Evergrande has uh, and then, you know, sell the uh, collateral to the next developer and hoping uh, they recover, you know, uh, you know, not the full amount, at least 80, 70% of that. Now, still painful experience uh, for sure. How would you uh, characterize, it sounds like you're, you're somewhat bullish on the broad you know, e- equity market in, in China, uh, just because things are so cheap. How would you, would you say you are more or less bullish on the banking system? I would say I am bullish on the uh, sort of top uh, state-owned banks, uh, the really blue chip top state-owned banks, because uh, 
they're the ones that sort of participate in the stress testing, right? They're the ones that have always been in full communication with Beijing about what is coming down the pikes, uh, the kind of, you know, right down that they might, they might face. And so if you look at them, um, they have always had classified on their balance sheet a lot of bad loans. And it's not because, you know, they've made so many bad loans and, and so they're, they're forced to, to, to sort of recognize bad loans, right? They've always been making provisions because they kind of knew what policy is coming forth. And by making such a large provision, they kept more of the internal cash flow. They, are, they, they artificially make it such that they can't make more loans. So actually the balance sheet and uh, the bad loan that's actually on the book um, is sort of far less than what has been uh, disclosed. So the, the, the disclosure is actually uh, significantly more aggressive because they knew what might be coming. Uh, so in fact, uh, as an anecdote, a very good you know, friend of mine who was a bank executive, they said they actually tried to reclassify a lot of good loans as bad loans so that the bank would have you know, who would just have this automatically no to anyone pressuring the bank to lend out more money to help out a real estate developer so they can sort of push off that kind of local political pressure. Uh, and then so, you know, uh, that just sort of tells you, like they, they already know what might be coming and they have sort of erected self-defense mechanism. Uh, they're, they're, of course, now all being traded as if um, they're, they're likely to, to experience systemic crisis or there's, there could be a bank run or they could you know, lose significant amount of their, their balance sheet as a result of bad debt. But I would say that, first of all, has already been provisioned for. Uh, and second of all, again, that risk is overinflated. So would you, would you say a lot of the banks are in China are trading at dis distressed prices? Because if I look at a, a stock like Tencent or Alibaba, I would say their their you know five year stock pattern actually looks more in a bear market than many Chinese banks and definitely U.S. banks, uh, pretty you know like New York Community Bank for example. Are there any Chinese stocks that are you know trading at you know down ninety five percent? Because we have banks like that in the you know, not not the banks. Yeah. So so um, yeah. first of all, the, the you know people in China recognize that uh, you know the banks will always be bailed out and the largest shareholder of all these banks are are the state, right? So you know favorable policies and tailwinds. So they generally trade with a little bit of that that the government put embedded in there. So they, they tend to hold their value well. Now, of course, they still trade at very, very cheap uh, valuation multiple uh, versus kind of their monopoly position and versus the amount of cash flow uh, they have. Uh, so if you just look at how much, if you look at the stocks that, that, that have had poor performance, yes, you know the banks are certainly not the worst performers, uh, certainly versus the tech. But I would say, if you say who is more likely to be trading at a distressed valuation relative to potential, I would say for banks, it's very obvious. Uh, for the tech companies, it's less obvious in the, in the following sense, right? The headwind that the tech companies face, two front, right? One is regulatory, and I think the regulatory ones is significantly reduced. But the other one is a lot of the newer tech platforms in China have simply you know, taken advantage of the last three years and really took market share away from uh, the Alibabas, right? Just look at Pinduoduo, right? I mean, yep, yep. This is this. They're tiny relative to Alibaba uh, three years ago, and their their performance the last three years is, uh, I think, you know, something like plus a hundred percent, right? They've doubled their stock price, whereas Alibaba's probably fallen sixty five percent. So it just says a lot of this is not just Alibaba and regulatory headwind because Pinduoduo is also a e commerce platform, right? A lot of it is also because newer technology, perhaps one that's, you know, sort of better suited for, for the post-COVID environment, has taken a lot of market shares away from the dominant players. And that's something we haven't, we, we, we should factor in, right? Because that's not just sentiment, right? That's actually pure competition. Yeah, I, I think Pinduoduo is the biggest retailer in China, right? Uh, probably yeah. by, by yeah. transactions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that's what I mean. not, not market cap, yeah. Uh, it, it has surpassed Alibaba, uh, which is uh, very surprising. Tell us about, yeah, the technology platform. You said that the regulatory scrutiny on many tech platforms was was reduced. What did you mean by that? The regulators have gone from um, being very antagonistic, right? And it's an antagonistic on multiple fronts, all the way from, hey, you know, you are actually not a Chinese company because uh, you're listed offshore. And all of your profit goes to this Cayman Shell company through the VIE structure. So from challenging their corporate governance, corporate structure, and their listing venue, 
to then challenging them on uh, data security. It's like, look, you know, you 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 might not actually be a Chinese company, so we can't regulate you like a Chinese company. Um, and so this is a foreign company who owns a lot of sensitive, you know, Chinese private citizen data. And so they're sort of going after these tech platforms uh, from just a variety of different directions, right? You know, so that was true of Uber that that sort of listed. It's true of Alibaba that has already been listed and trading for a while. Uh, now, I think that has largely eased off, right? You don't see regulators making an issue of that because those issues really haven't been addressed, but the regulators are lo no longer sort of latching on to that to make an issue of it. So this is what I mean by that That headwind uh, seems to have sort of eased off or ceased completely. And is that also true of the high profile uh, uh crackdown in let's say edu you know uh, uh, to online tutoring and that kind of stuff is that is that crackdown largely over yeah so uh funny thing is um the the, the person who was in charge of sort of putting that in place has uh, since then been fired and uh, now um sort of tutoring has sort of come back to life right so so the regulators has clearly gone the other direction because when it was first sort of put in place it was any kind of you know Online education, offline tutoring was was not allowed. Uh, now they have to redefine sort of everything, and uh, I would say, you know, other than probably a very narrow set of tutoring activities um, that is not allowed, everything else is sort of you know uh, back to where it was before. And then you've seen that the company EDU, right? That was the biggest player mm -hmm. and probably the most iconic. Uh, their share price have have uh, uh, recovered um, very very significantly, right there. I, I think you know you give them the, you give it probably an, another few upper limit uh, days that it's be back to where it was. So if I, I believe looking at your ETF, I believe I, I don't see a uh, uh, ten cent or Alibaba. Why uh, are you not invested in those companies? And why do you think the stocks that you do own in your ETF? What is better about those stocks that uh, you know you're uh, that that Tencent and and you know the other mega uh, stocks that are traded in the U.S. don't don't have? Well, so first of all, um, these tech giants, um, you know, they're already trading at you know fairly rich valuation, even though it's come down a lot. But historically, they've always traded more the Nasdaq type valuation than the domestic valuation, right? And you kind of go look, you know, can I buy domestic? Uh, consumer growth oriented themes at a 30% discount versus what I can buy in terms of a Alibaba or Tencent. And you look domestically, yes, absolutely, right? Um, just give me an example. You know, most people think, oh, you know, the only way to create wealth in China must be from tech IPOs, you know, technology shares. But no, for a long time, the wealthiest person in China uh, right now is the guy who sells water. The last one was the guy who sold hot pot, right? So, you know, Growth in China is not just tech, right? Growth in China is just anything and everything that's on the consumer side. And there are just a lot of those names domestically that are smaller and much cheaper. So Alibaba and Tencent with their PEs of, I just looked, 12 or 13, those are too expensive for you. Because I can get something comparable that's growing faster, cheaper, I'm sure. Now, at, at 12 and 13 is still much better, right? It's still much better than, than, uh, than wh where they were at, you know, at, at 20 plus before. Like gold did, Bitcoin is establishing itself as a macro asset that potentially helps hedge against the government devaluation of your money. Finally, you can easily access Bitcoin in a low-cost ETF with the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, ticker HODL. Search the ticker HODL in your brokerage app today. Visit vanek.com slash HODLFG to learn more. That's vanek.com slash HODLFG. Now the disclosures. Investing involves risk and you can lose money on an investment in the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, also known as the Trust or HODL. The value of Bitcoin and therefore the value of the trust shares could decline rapidly, including to zero. You could lose your entire principal investment. For a more complete discussion of the risk factors relative to the trust, carefully read the prospectus link below. Thanks. Let's get back to the interview. Yo, Jason, when do you think uh, historians or, or you know, market participants five years from now, 10 years from now, do you think that people will look at right now as the bottom in Chinese equities? I definitely think so. I mean, the market is too large to go away, right? I mean, you're, you're talking about yeah, it being the world's factory, right? That is not changing anytime soon. Um, its per capita GDP stands at 13,000 and continues to grow as they sort of gain efficiency, gain productivity. Yeah, I mean, so... I think everything else that people are afraid of right now is more noise. Um, it's not that they're not meaningful, they're not important, but I think once you look at a longer time scale, they'll feel more like noise. 
um, you know, the, the emerging of one of the world's hardest working economy, right? It's called it one of the world's hardest working economy. Uh, you know, I think that'll continue to continue. And when, when you have a hardworking, productive economy, it'll drive, uh, it'll drive wealth creation, it'll drive growth, and that's going to filter its way through to the stock market. You said China will continue to be the world's uh, factory. I, I want to explore that a little bit because there are efforts to uh, move production either back to you know, the U.S. or Mexico, or you know maybe Apple is going to move a little bit to, to India. But at the same time, China itself, is, is it not trying to uh, move up the value chain and say, no, we're not going to, yep. just, you know, we don't want to produce like plastic toys. Let's produce the best electric vehicles in the world, which, you know, by some accounts that they are. Um, I noticed, you know, you, you have BYD. In, in, in your uh, ETF, how, how how will that ch change of China attempting to move up the value chain, as well as uh, you know non Chinese companies, uh, maybe diversifying their their supply chains and production uh, uh, lines away from China? How is that going to impact the future of the Chinese economy? So I would sure I would say French shoring uh, is accelerating a lot of things that would have happened, you know, just on its own pace, anyways, right? Because to, to understand, you know, what is in store for China the next, you know, 10 years, you can just go back and look at what happened to Japan once it got sort of very developed and its per capita GDP was quite high and it was starting to make things that are, are, are you know, not just low cost OEM, but really, you know, global quality, right? And then later on, you got Taiwan and South Korea. China is sort of at that point, right? It, it is no longer just dirt cheap, right? Today, you, you manufacture in China, not because it's dirt cheap, it's because, wow, it's really good quality for a really competitive price. And no one can sort of get that price quality ratio just right. Um, so, you know, China has been trying to push out a lot of manufacturing. It doesn't want to make t-shirts or jeans or like you say, plastic toys. That, that's being pushed out to many other parts of Asia, to Mexico. Um, now with French shoring, there's just sort of an acceleration of that trend that was already happening, right? Uh, for, the, for, for those of, uh, for the people, for your audience who, who's been to Europe, just go to Italy, right? Two thirds of Italian textile manufacturer, fashion manufacturer, are now owned and operated by the Chinese in in China. The, or it's Chinese owning factories in Italy in or Italy it's... in Italy. So okay. China has moved its factory to Italy. Right? Very interesting because they can take kind of their their experience in running factories, and now this will be made in Italy. Right, gives you a higher brand, you know, better margin, and that the same thing is happening. And and you you've seen that in the trade data that Mexico, uh, now U.S. biggest trade partner, but like how the heck did that happen, right? Well, it's because now you're seeing a lot of Chinese manufacturers moving their factory to Mexico, benefiting from NAFTA, the proximity to the U.S. Um, and, you know, these are Chinese operated factories. Um, so with all the operational efficiency and, and look, it's just part of China understanding French showing and implications and uh, these clever entrepreneurs, are you expect clever Chinese entrepreneurs to be very plugged into where can they go to cost down, to reduce frictions, to maintain the business that they currently have. Uh, so, you know, I'm not too worried about the Chinese manufacturers. Um, yeah, you know, they, they, they will, they will move their factories. Jason, what is the. Uh, cheapest Chinese stock in your ch uh, China strategy, or one of the cheapest, either in your ETF or your your non non publicly traded uh, uh, strategies. Like, how cheap are we talking? You know, PEs of four, three. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, we we are seeing some of the the uh, manufacturers who are really trading at the absolute cyclical bottom, uh, who are kind of at the PE of four. That's cheap. And yeah, and when and and when that sort of cycle sort of you know reverses, um, you you will kind of see them go back to at least historical norm, uh, if not you know with a bit of a bull market behind them, perhaps you know to the historical highs. And there, uh, you're not just banking on earnings per share growth; um, you're really benefiting from uh, this shift in sentiment and therefore shift in evaluation multiple. Jason, earlier you said that uh, you know, many Chinese citizens who uh, accumulate savings tend not to put it in the stock market. So that, you know, that makes sense now with the Chinese equity market so so beaten up. But there was a time where Chinese equities were, were trading very richly, I think of you know, early 2021. So if it wasn't the Chinese uh, you know, citizens savings, who was bidding up these, these Chinese shares? Was it, was it the hedge fund people in America? So this just sort of give you a sense of scale, right? The Chinese, so it, when you're talking about like, you know, in, in 2020, 2021, when the, when the market was quite exuberant, 
um, you know, the stock market, Chinese stock market at that time was about 13 trillion in size. So, you know, not, not quite the U.S., you know, at, at 40, but it was still the world's second largest uh, stock market and then very liquid. And, and that was 95, 98% all sort of Chinese investors, either through mutual funds or directly through their own brokerage account, right? So, it's, you know, for, we, we should just acknowledge this, like foreign flows into China is tiny relative to some of the domestic wealth that's in the market. Well, what's interesting is that is still a tiny fraction of the household wallet. The Chinese household oversaves excessively, right? If you think of mm -hmm. the uh, American household savings rate is borderline negative, right? <laughs> the Chinese household savings rate is like 30%, right? And, and, and at the speed which the GDP is growing, the size of GDP, they save a lot of money right? by, by some estimate, right? And then sort of, you know, you got to take this with a grain of salt. Um, between what's directly in bank deposits and things that are quasi-bank deposits, you know, uh, there's about 30 trillion US dollars worth of cash-like things just sitting there, right? And then you tag on real estate, right? So by comparison, the, the equities market is small versus mm -hmm. um, the other storage of value. So it, it has been mainly uh, Chinese citizens selling selling shares. Uh, what? Yes. So I think, you know, from a, from a non-Chinese perspective, we're very familiar with it, with those narratives, but within China, what, you know, if you talk to someone who said, oh yeah, I used to be investing in the stock market, but then I, I sold a little bit or I, you know, I stopped investing. What are the sort of narratives that people tell themselves within China? Within China, people are probably more pessimistic about mm -hmm. their own stock market and about um, kind of their own economic growth and economic growth policies than I would say even foreigners, right? Like, so this is not, oh, you know, uh, Americans are pessimistic about China and then therefore they're selling their Chinese ETF and that's crashed the Chinese market. That, that is not at all what's happening, right? It's the domestic sentiment being even more negative, right? And, and it, the funny thing is, right? I mean, the, the Chinese recognize that if they, they want a balanced view, they should read global newspapers, right? So the Chinese read a lot of American reportings about what's going on in China, right? And that freaks them out, right? And, and so the sentiment is very, very fragile, very negative, but also we've seen that before, right? Like the sentiment swing in China is very extreme. Right? Again, these are very short-term capital. They're not long-term pension funds that can sort of ignore the noise and not have the perspective of history. Right? These are all retail individuals who've probably forgotten you know, what 2020 was like and only remembers kind of the last two months of paying in their own you know, stock portfolio. Right. As a, as a uh, quantitative investor, what moves the Chinese market? And for example, you know, if someone were to ask me or ask you what moves the U.S. equity market, obviously in the long term, it is earnings and uh, you know, economic growth and inflation, stock buybacks, dividend, that sort of things. Um, but you know, on an intraday basis, if Jay Powell has a meeting and he says some pretty dovish things, the stock market is probably going to go up. If there's an inflation print that comes out and it's lower than expected it, you know, in the inflationary time that we've been in, that's probably going to be bullish. If there's a huge inflationary beat, uh, you know, inflation is higher than expected as it was in 2022, probably going to drive the stock market down. Obviously, you know, it's very hard to predict these things. Like if, if you could predict this thing, it'd be easy to make money in the stock market, which of course it isn't. But uh, we have a general sense of like what moves the stock market up and down. In China, what is it? I mean, are people look, listening to the People's Bank of China meeting? Are, are they looking at the economic data? Uh, what moves markets? Well, it's about the same things, right? Over the long run, uh, and unfortunately, this is true in China as well. Uh, over the long run, companies have to make money, right? You got to have earnings growth, right? You got to have positive cash flow, right? You got to have a product out there that people want to buy. So in the long run, it's exactly the same thing, right? You cannot just hype up a stock based on a story and expect that to go on forever. But on any given day, right, really it's dominated by um, macro, like so, you know, the equivalent of a Jay Powell, right? It'll be the People's mm -hmm. Bank of China. This will be this regular saying that there'll be, you know, the, the 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 National Party Congress and and kind of the transcript for what was said and people tea leaf you know tea leaf reading, so in the short run it's it's a lot of you know noise that's more kind of macro in nature and a lot of gossip about individual companies and industries that moves prices. Yeah, yeah it's uh, it's all it's all it's all gossip. That is that is really interesting. So so you you know, invest your firm Radiant. You invest not just uh, in China but but all emerging markets, de developed markets too. How has the emerging market universe, which of course, by definition, is, is not a monolith. How has that sort of index uh, um, 
uh, advanced and and performed as China has really lagged behind because China was a what forty percent component of thirty percent of of most emerging market indices, and you know India has been doing well, but but you know India was not that big of a part, and um, maybe it's bigger now. But what has it been like where you know the biggest constituent of of EM has been such a laggard, China? Yeah, and so Jack. First and foremost, you hit on a super important point, right? Like if you just held on to like a EM basket passively, right, then you kind of just index it. What you would have had is like at the height of China, where everyone loves China, everyone thinks China's going to overtake the U.S. You would have almost fifty percent of EM portfolio in China, and India would be tiny. But then, of course, right, kind of it's like maximal allocation to the most thematic story stock. And you know you're gonna do poorly, right? Because the sentiment swings, the cycles, right? It means you know when everyone's sort of too in love with something, it tends to do poorly later, and then you get too pessimistic. First of all, you gotta be a bit more active and then sort of think it through, right? Um, you know, obviously having 50% of EM in China is just too risky, too concentrated, and uh, and then betting way too big on China continuing on this path and not having much al- allocation to India sort of misses the point, right? It's like, look, you know, India has a great opportunity to follow the Chinese trajectory and to evolve and go from a per capita income of 3,000 eventually to 13,000, right? Yeah, so China has been the biggest lagger and really drag down EM performance, right? Without China, uh, EMX China performance is actually quite respectable, right? Last year, you would have did, done 20 something uh, at a time when China did minus 25%, right? If you were to take that out. So um, we we are a big proponent that you need to look at the French shoring uh, theme and understand, well, what does that mean? Other than it's a headwind for China, but what does that mean as a tailwind for Mexico, as a tailwind? Uh, for the rest of Southeast Asia as a tailwind for the more developed part of EM, like Taiwan and South Korea. So Taiwan and South Korea are part of EM? Yes, they still are. <laughs> even though their, they really shouldn't be. Per, <laughs> even though they really shouldn't be, right? Uh, per capita income perspective, on just the quality of kind of their, their, their products, you know, they, they, they probably are more advanced than many European countries, but uh, it's just legacy reasons they're still stuck in the EM basket. If I were to ask the same question I asked about what moves the Chinese market, what moves EM markets? And if I were to you know, say the 2000 to 2007 emerging markets did exceptionally well. Awesome. And then 2009, you know, the, the, the previous decade after that, uh, 2009 to 2019, they kind of uh, were somewhat of, of a laggard. What was different about those two decades where in the first one, they crushed it. And the second one, they were doing not so hot. Cycles, right? I mean, these... Uh, macro cycles are much longer than than kind of um, individual stock market cycles, and uh, you know EM had that almost ten year stretch before the global financial crisis sort of caused a insane flight to safety, insane flight to capital that destroyed a lot of the EM currency. So before that major crisis, um, you know EM was going through a wonderful cycle where um, you know. They're hitting on all cylinders from from the resource oriented economies to the value add economies, you know, the the, the Southeast Asian economy. So they're hitting on all cylinders. Uh, but really, the the undoing was the the U.S. global financial crisis. Even though it's the crisis of our own doing, it actually triggered a currency crisis, flight to safety, flight to capital that actually destroyed some of these more fragile economies. Um, and then, of course, and the, the the U.S. recovered better and recovered because of the the tremendous. Uh, social media-based technology platform sort of growth cycle. Uh, now, if you if you believe in cycles, right? Like it, it, it one could argue, right? Like you know, the the the, the cycle of EM underperformance uh, has been a bit over than ten years, um, and given how cheap it is, it might be the cycle of EM again. And so, you really want to look at kind of the future of EM, as you know, well, is there a thesis for the resource-dominated EM economy? to have another sort of resource boom for the uh, manufacturing export dominated economy, right? Um, you know, do they have kind of um, a, a sort of thesis for, for that to, to, to sort of outperform? And I would say on the resource side, at least, like we're going into a world where uh, geopolitical tension uh, stays high, remains high, and we seem to be adding to it. So I think resource-based EM are continue to will continue to see high prices, high demand, and high global attention to get access to them, and that's definitely a tailwind for them. So I'm I'm actually quite positive about that part of EM. Uh, and then I would say on the manufacturing part of EM, right? If the China French shoring continues, 
right? Even if China keeps 90% of its business, right? Just like 10% of that massive flow would buoy up uh, Mexico, Vietnam, and Indonesia tremendously. So I think yeah, that's, that's quite exciting, especially now if you think of like AI and the requirement on the hardware side, right? That's, that's, that's just be honest, right? Like um, what manufacturing companies in Asia need is major U.S. innovation, right? Because like innovation is, is just not something Asia is known for. It's known for engineering, right? It's known for making what's already made in the U.S. just cheaper and a lot more of it. So, you know, NVIDIA is sort of demonstrating like a new hardware demand, right? Very soon, Asia will figure out how to do that and they'll just do that at a third of the price. And that's going to drive another manufacturing and tech boom uh, in, uh, in kind of the export oriented part of Asia. And that'll be great for EM as well. So I'm seeing sort of at least two meaningful catalysts for two parts of EM. The, re the resource-rich emerging market, that would be Brazil. What other countries would be in that basket of resource-rich EMs? Yeah, so, you know, a lot of LATM uh, are, are mm -hmm. quite resource-rich, you know, um, and certainly the, the Middle East, um, you, know, you know, energy right. being such a strategic uh, component. Africa, you know, there's so much mining of cobalt um, that is critical for, for making batteries. So these regions... Um, are going to be a big beneficiary. So tell me about Africa. You know, if I look at, you know, what, one of the, the mainstream emerging market index or, or ETF, I'm pretty sure like all of the countries, you know, I, I don't, it kept, comes a while before I see any country in, in Africa. I mean, it's mainly South Africa, but, you know, I, the, the weightings are so small and, the, you know, the, I don't think the stock prices are that developed. So would that be considered more uh, frontier markets? I mean, I, I know that the terms don't really matter, but uh, like, how much of the emerging market average beta basket is countries in Africa? And what are your views on it? I would say um, the EM over time, the resource rich ones have become such a small component of the EM, right? And then, you know, be it Africa, be it Middle East, be it LATM, right? If you kind of go, oh, you know, that just round out countries are too small in the basket, you would actually have very few left. Uh, and again, I would say that's just a index design bug rather than a, a, a useful feature. Right? You really want to say, look, we, we just care about sort of less developed um, countries where if they just get a few things right and 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 sort of run with it, they can do really really well. Right? And so that's how we think about EM. Right? So so we don't think about frontier versus EM. We really think mm -hmm. of the like, like countries are less developed, and we're a little bit more of capital, just getting a few products right. Um, getting some infrastructure right, they can they can they can create a lot of wealth. So, so that's how we think about it. What's it like having a uh, sort of quantitative model of, of investing in so many different companies? Where you, know, I presume, if you're invested in you know 100 companies, you're not on a first name basis with the management from from every every company. And if you're investing in, it's not just one country. You're investing in you know Nigeria and Thailand, and uh, I mean it, it must be very difficult. Yeah, so if you are a pure Stock picking fundamental researcher, um, that's just impossible, right? To manage an EM portfolio well is impossible. Right? Too many countries in there and they're too far to get to. And, and you know, frankly, the cost and effort uh, would discourage most firms from doing a, a particularly good job, right? So being more data driven, being more systematic, you know, quantitative means you say, hey, look, now I'm going to do as good a job as possible based on available data that I can buy, that I can gather. And I'm going to build model off of like, you know, well, how did China develop? Well, how did Japan develop? You know, how did Korea develop? And how did some countries not develop? And how can we sort of apply these models and, you know, look at what's happening in Brazil, right? Look at what's happening in Saudi Arabia and see if I find patterns. You know, history doesn't repeat perfectly, but it sure rhymes a lot, right? And so we can see what's happening in China right now and go, you know, that feels a lot like what Taiwan went through, right? That feels a lot like Japan went through, right? You look at BYD, right? BYD today is not that different than Toyota in the 70s, right? Toyota in the 70s was like the worst car you could buy, lowest quality, right? Um, and it, it could only get into like, you know, poor part of Europe and, and, and Middle East because, you know, that, that was the market that was willing to buy from them because they had no brand and no quality just yet. And that's where BYD is today, right? No one knows who they are, right? They got to go in with a low price strategy and gradually their quality, their low price will start to convert people and they'll build some brand. And then it'll be a long time before they can come into the U.S. And the U.S. will have some incumbent automaker that tries to, you know, stop 
uh, Toyota back in the 80s, just as they will try to prevent BYD from coming in. Um, so it's, you know, it's the same script. <laughs> You said questions earlier about, uh, we could ask the model, how did China do what it did? How is that similar to Japan? Those to me seem like questions that a human being would ask another human being. How do you get the Excel spreadsheet or you know the Python to, to give answers and insight on those very seemingly non-quantitative, very qualitative matters? And this is where the word quantamental comes in, right? You, you want to use data to inform you, right? But you got to be intelligent and say, well, what data do I use? Uh, a lot of people just say, oh, I want to use, you know, as much data as I can, right? Like the people who are trying to study the S&P today by saying, wow, I can look at US data going back to the 1800s. It's like, yes, that is more data, but it's not useful data, right? This is some- Yeah, there was no Apple in 1890. Yeah. It was yeah. a bunch of railroads that lost money. <laughs> yeah, so you, you want to use some human intelligence to say, if I'm going to look at data, right? What is actually informative data? And so this would be like, oh, if I want to study China, do I go and look at, you know, Chinese stock market data from, you know, 1992 through 2000, you know, which probably is when there are very few stocks and not a lot of liquidity, or do I look at, you know, Japan or Taiwan or South Korea uh, when they're about to enter the MSCI and had tremendous retail trading, right? That's probably where, if you look at that data, and you say, machine learning, go fit the model to the data. The calibrated parameters will make more sense for you to then um, apply to the China model than trying to calibrate the data you know, using you know, 1992 China data. And what are some uh, like data inputs, so the key data inputs to your models that you know, attempt to make predictive uh, price algorithms? You know, so on a company wide, you mentioned quality. So I assume that's like free cash flow growth, profit margins, that kind of stuff. You know, low debt or low debt to equity, something like that. But on a country level, what are the different inputs? And I imagine you know, in the 1990s, a lot of uh, you know Western investors got very bullish on emerging market countries because they had high growth. But high growth does not always equal high stock market performance. In the case of China, or in the case of Malaysia, you know, or many other emerging market, uh, Thailand, Indonesia, stuff, places like that. Uh, what are the sort of qualitative, you know, for lack of a better word, quantumental macro drivers of it's okay, you know, oh, you know, this country is growing at 10%, but actually, it's not bullish, it's it's not bullish growth, whereas this country is only growing at 5%, but it's actually, you know, the fundamentals are very solid. So, you know, even though there's not a lot of sort of macro thinking and macro variables that go into, you know, building models, selecting models. Now, uh, it then to sort of cascade that down and you 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 apply that information to look at individual stocks from a you know bottom up perspective right and so um, all the macro information will sort of filter through and be expressed in terms of companies within industries and sort of industries against other industries um, and so i would say like you say right because if you look at pure macro you run into this risk of you can have periods of strong gdp growth but with bad stock market performance, right? We, we've seen that mm -hmm. over and over again, right? It just says, look, macro is one variable and it has to interact with many things at the industry and the company level. And so ultimately you can only make money by selecting the right companies, right? The right companies in the context of that macro backdrop. So you don't use your models to select a country allocation top down, you start with the company wide analysis, and then the country allocation is what it is based on that. Correct. Yes. You know, again, you're going to generally, you know, create country overweights or underweights that makes sense, right? Because, you know, usually it's the great companies in that country that, you know, will be sort of world leading in terms of its sort of industry capability. And that leads the country overweight or underweight. Has your model gotten more bullish on Chinese companies and you know, their allocation to China has grown, not because they're looking at anything in the macro data, but just because the companies are getting cheaper relative to other ones? Yeah, so certainly valuation um, uh, is a big driver. But in terms of our biggest overweights right now, our biggest overweight right now is we have a big overweight into the blue chip state-owned uh, enterprises. And that's simply because if you kind of look at their relative valuation, given the kind of risk they have, um, they, they look like they have almost a, you know, a, a downside insurance provided by the government. And so you only get upside capture. So given the, the valuation, given the low risk, um, they become very attractive for the model. 
Okay, so that's that's very interesting because I know uh, you know often sometimes investors say, oh, I'll invest in Chinese companies X the state owned enterprise, and you're saying no, we're most what we're most bullish on in China is yeah, the right state owned now. enterprises. They must be they, right now at this very juncture. You know, we're, we're recording this you know uh, late March uh, 2024. So I guess that that uh, goes to the the real governance question of you know if you own a company in the U.S. or the U.K. like that company uh, you know may not have the best management, but generally they are trying to advocate for shareholders and they're trying to increase you know their earnings, which hopefully they will pay to you in buybacks or or dividends. And I think you know in Western investors part of the reason maybe a lot of Western investors pulled out of the market, or I should say non Chinese investors, is because there's a sense that no, you know, there's a risk that this will be nationalized. What do I really own here? And I think probably that that sense of risk may be at its greatest with the state owned enterprises. So what do you really own here if you own a state owned enterprise? And is your answer based on you know what what your models are say or your or individual research? A lot of our top-down research do become our models that goes then into stock selection. For example, so we had the same thesis, which is like, boy, everyone hates state-owned enterprises. And I can understand why you would hate state-owned enterprises, right? Like the political interference is one thing, right? And just the fact that it's viewed as a, just let's just say, look, it feels like it's the DMV that somehow became a listed company, right? And so you, you just don't yeah. feel like it's going to be very efficient, right? People are not incentivized to, 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 to do a great job or create profits. So we went into it with the same suspicion. But when we look closer, and so we actually went and bought data, and then we realized, wow, you know, there's a lot of data. You you can classify uh, state-owned enterprises into centrally connected, those that are sort of operated directly by Beijing, to the you know local municipality connected. And what you see is, like, if you look at the municipality connected state-owned enterprise, so there's like a smaller local state-owned enterprise, like the performance is abysmal, right? It's exactly what you predict, right? It's probably the mayor and all of his family being hired and pay egregious, you know, salaries, right? And it's just not productive. Uh, and then you look at the centrally connected Beijing operated state owned enterprises, like they have better efficiency ratio than anyone else. And their management doesn't actually even make a lot of money. Uh, and if they make any mistake, they don't pay, you know, growing dividends, they just get fired and replaced by someone else. So, and so, so we realized, wow, you know, that's really good governance, right? Because your largest shareholder wants you to pay, wants you to grow earnings and wants you to pay dividends. And if you fail to deliver that, you just get fired, right? So there's no entrenchment problem. Uh, so it's actually quite surprising when we saw that data. Uh, and so we, we actually now, after looking at the data and seeing it repeat over so many cycles, we have very strong confidence that, okay, like the Beijing control sale enterprise are so visible they're almost like the face of the Communist Party. Like it's a testament of stewardship. And so when they underperform, Beijing has to fire people because you now have embarrassed the government and then your incompetence is on display. And then you're replaced by someone. The next guy would go, hey, you know, I better do a really good job. I don't want to get fired. Um, and so where this is not true is, of course, in the you know small local municipalities where Beijing doesn't have transparency. So you're not bullish on the uh, regional one so much as the literally Beijing, the the Chinese Communist Party. So, what was what would some examples be of state Communist Party Chinese, you know, by, by Beijing com companies, state-owned enterprises? One of the easiest telltale sign is if the name of the company starts with China, like only if you're <laughs> directly managed by Beijing, can your company name start with China? It was something I learned. It's like, oh, you know, when I register a company, can I just call it China something? No, like you cannot register any trademark, any name that starts with the name China, because it immediately communicates. China State Construction is pe yep. is Petro China Petro China is a state owned enterprise. Yep. Yeah. What kind of dividend yields are we are we talking about here? Yeah. So we're often looking at dividend yields that are uh, so right now many of them have dividend yields higher than your bank deposit rate, right? It's how attractive they are. Right? So you know, you're, you could easily find someone who's paying like four and a half percent, and like the bank deposit yield right now is like two percent, right? So that's a pretty good deal. So outside of China, what is your biggest overweight um, in? The emerging market world, and I, I should also say that you know, again, you're not ch choosing that. You're starting with the companies first, as we as we said before. But what is your biggest country overweight, and why? Yeah, so I would say the the we have probably two. Uh, uh, the biggest country overweight is Mexico for us, yeah. right? And uh, um, you know, a lot of that is, you know, we are seeing uh, the, I would say the, you know, kind of the early day benefits of. You know, sort of friends showing to Mexico. You know, whether it's now the U.S. is buying more from Mexico, and that's sort of starting to show up in the Mexican export data. 
or you got China exporting a lot more to Mexico as sort of a trade through station where you know Chinese factories are moving to Mexico and they need a lot of intermediate materials, you know, to, to come from China into Mexico. Uh, you're seeing, you know, even you know Taiwan and Korea exporting more to Mexico because again, now the components don't go to China, they go directly to Mexico. So you're actually seeing that in, in trade data. You're seeing that show up in export oriented firms and the sectors that supports that. What's your biggest underweight or maybe, you know, what, what do you think is kind of the most overrated within the emerging markets? I would say, so this is not a structural uh, underweight. And I want to be super, super clear about that because it was our big overweight to start with. You know, so India was a big overweight for us a while back. It's gone to uh, a, a, a minor underweight because Everyone just got too enthusiastic about India. Um, and, you know, is India going to grow? Absolutely, right? But I don't think India becomes China, right? I don't think India replaces China as the world's factory. And that's evidenced by, look, Foxconn, the world's biggest contract manufacturer, you know, went to India, plowed in billions and billions of dollars, and they still struggle to make the latest iPhone, right? So the iPhones made in India are not sold in the U.S. The iPhones made in India are kind of the, 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 the lower spec, older models. Hmm. So they, they've just struggled with uh, quality and, uh, and, and also labor efficiency. Um, and it's just because India is not positioned to be a manufacturer, right? It is positioned to be, you know, the world's greatest software outsourcing, call center outsourcing, right? Because their advantage is software development, right? Their advantage is they, their natural language is, is English. So they, they, they can, you know, do commerce well with the rest of the world. So they, they, that's not an advantage in a, 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 you know, factory floor. So, uh, so I think people got a little carried away thinking somehow just because India has a lot of population comparable to, you know, com in, comparable in size to China, that India will just become the world's factory and all the factory will move to India. Uh, so I think there, there was some uh, unrealistic enthusiasm around that theme. Uh, and so, you know, when India made new highs, we, we sort of eased off. Jason, I know we talked a lot about China, but I just want to know, I, I know you've talked about a, a Beijing put. And specifically, can you talk about the mechanics of how the, the Chinese Communist Party will assist the, the U.S., uh, excuse me, the, the Chinese stock market? And I know you, you wrote about how you know, money is being forced out of real estate and bank deposit uh, products into uh, wealth management and how this could be fuel for the stock market. Tell us about how the Chinese, the CCP, you know, could it could might assist the uh, Chinese equity market via a Beijing put and in a way that's direct, not just, you know, lowering the interest rate by five basis points or, you know, putting out a press release that says some nice things, but actually, you know, redirecting billions and billions and hundreds of billions of dollars into the equity market and, and doing stuff like that, as well as the, the Bloomberg news that uh, maybe some Chinese state owned enterprises would use their cash reserves to buy stocks. I mean, how do you how do you feel about that as the owner of uh, many Chinese state owned enterprises? <laughs> yeah, so I'll talk about the second channel that you just talked about, which is like state owned enterprises buying. I mean, I literally witnessed that, right? I was at, at lunch and someone got a call and and it was Essentially, like, you know, sort of Beijing calling a, a major state-owned investment fund, uh, asking, well, you know, uh, what's been your buying activity? What have you bought today? <laughs> right? So it, it, it does actually happen, but it's not unique to China, right? Like, you know, um, uh, one of our big clients, the, 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 the big pension fund in, in Taiwan, uh, they also do that. They, they do counter cyclical buying, meaning when the market falls a lot, the government is under a lot of pressure and they would sort of jump in with a government reserve fund. Now in China, um, both you have the National Social Security Fund, which is a pretty big monster, right? You got um, the Sovereign Wealth Fund. Um, you also have a lot of regional and provincial investment funds, industry funds that hi historically are meant to provide really, you know, private equity and venture capital money to support industry development. But, you know, those are very, very well funded, often overfunded because, you know, these, these, these deals have all become quite valuable once they go IPO. So they, they're sitting on a lot of cash. Um, so they're basically buying, right? They're basically buying at a market low. Um, now the question is, you know, does this do enough? Uh, it certainly is a great signal when you're actually buying rather than just saying, oh, you know, the mm. economy is going to be great, right? So, so it's, it's not cheap talk anymore when the government's actually buying. Uh, and what you're seeing is years to day, right? These government-owned mega cap stocks have outperformed the broad market uh, by, by quite a bit. If you look at kind of the small cap, which are more private companies versus the large cap performance, like this this year, I think the differential is probably closer to 10%, right? That's how much like the large cap state enterprises have done. 
Um, so this first part, right? Directly, government in the short run could just buy, and they they they've done so historically uh, in counter cyclical buying. And funny thing is, they actually do make good money, right? Because that's like the Warren Buffett, you know, approach, right? Buy when everyone's fearful, and that's what they're doing. Um, now the other piece, I think that's probably more significant in the long run, is you know the Chinese bureaucrats, you know, bureaucrats in Beijing. Um, you know, one thing that does trouble them is they realize people think of their stock market, right? Their domestic retail investors think of their own stock market as a casino, right? It doesn't have a lot of good price discovery quality, right? It doesn't get long-term capital to, you know, companies that actually have great product, great innovators, right? And so, you know, capital can go randomly into thematic stocks, uh, fraudulent stocks, and then that's clearly mm -hmm, not good mm -hmm. for long-term development, right? So they want long-term capital. But if all you have is brokerage, right? You know, it's not in broker's best interest that you buy a stock and hold it forever, right? They just right, want right, to trade, right? And so there's so much like themes and stories that brokers constantly try to sell you. So, what the regulator, and so they they actually promoted this guy whose nickname is the broker butcher, right? Uh, uh -huh. Wu Ching, to be the new regulator, the head of the regulator. It's like, look, we want wealth management. We do not want just brokerage day trading, right? That's not what the industry should be about. And so there's this big push, like, all the banks got major KPIs. Like you need to convert a fraction of the deposits, the shadow banking stuff into wealth management, which is supposed to be long-term diversified portfolio that can be, you know, managed by rational portfolio managers that supply long-term, you know, price discovery capital to, to bring order to the stock market. Again, that's the ambition. That's the aspiration. Uh, it's probably going to take a long time to get there, but you know, sometimes China has shown the ability to sort of get there really fast. Um, because they've seen all the examples of you know good policy making and bad policy making from other countries. So the two elements of the Beijing put the the second thing you just mentioned is uh, the bureaucrats encouraging bank deposits to be converted to wealth management products. So you know a sixty forty portfolio, but you know something that includes uh, stocks. The first one is what, sorry, what are the you know, large Chinese institutional investors allocating towards the stock market? What sorry, yeah. did you say it was the Chinese pension system or the state owned enterprises or? So the, it's basically across the board, right? It's both from their social security fund. Uh, it's okay. also their regional investment funds and their industry investment funds. They're all jumping in. And then where does the People's Bank of China play? Does that have a large you know, impact? Another, when, when the People's Bank of China lowers interest rates, is that seen as stimulative for the stock market? or No. Really? So again, we can't take the American lens to understand yeah. um, the, the, the sort of Chinese monetary policy. Like, in the U.S., right, when we lower interest rate, everyone's cost of capital lowers, you know, cost of financing lowers, so we go spend money, we go borrow money, right? That's not in China, and you see that in Japan as well. So this is not just something weird about the Chinese, right? This is true of the Japanese as well. When the bank lowers interest rate, what happens is, because everyone saves so excessively, right? A big part of the disposable income is, is bank interest, right? So if you lower their bank interest, all of a sudden they feel really poor. They don't spend money, right? So in China, when 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 the government lowers your interest rate, you are actually quite angry and you stop spending money. We saw that in Japan, right? So it's not how it works in the U.S. Right? You can't just transpose that and say that's how it works in in China. So the Chinese government is very reluctant to just lower interest rate because they know, look, you know, I might be lowering costs of finance for some people, but Broadly, I'm making households um, feeling poor and they don't spend money and that's just bad for everyone. Uh, so generally, their policy is much more fiscal rather than monetary, right? It literally is um, the government has to go and spend money. <laughs> the government has to go, yeah, fiscal. There we go. Um, well, well, Jason, thanks so much for, for being so generous with your, your time uh, and insights. I've, I've definitely learned a lot. I know my, my audience has as well. Where can people uh, find you and then learn more about Radiant? Absolutely. So please, please um, find me on LinkedIn. I, I don't use X. Uh, I, I only use LinkedIn. I'm, I'm oh, uh, probably a little too old school for that. So find me on LinkedIn, connect with me and subscribe to my newsletter, uh, The Bridge. And then, you know, I, I hope to sort of bridge you, uh, you know, be, be the bridge for you and, you know, the different emerging economies to learn more about, you know, Taiwan, Korea, China, India. Uh, so yeah, lean on us as your, your, your source of information about emerging markets. That's great. You don't have Twitter. You don't have X. I'm kind of jealous of you. As I mentioned today, um, I my Twitter got uh, hacked uh, over this weekend. And for five days, I did not have access to my Twitter account, uh, which was was really bad. But I just want to say on the record now for my audience, I do have access to my Twitter account. So if you see me posting and you know, that is really me just to be very clear. So thank you, everyone for watching. And uh, thanks. Thanks again, Jason, for coming on. The pleasure, Jack.
Thanks for watching. Remember to check out vanek.com slash hodlfg to learn more about the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, ticker HODL. A reminder that Forward Guidance episodes are available on all podcast apps and on Twitter, where I post them regularly at JackFarley96. Thanks again. Until next time.